heart. I thank you for the deep love in her heart. I thank you, Lord, that she loves you and that she serves you every day of her life. I thank you, Lord, that she is uh, attentive to your spirit and is led by the spirit and prays by your spirit. I thank you, Lord, that she touches lives, so many lives around her. I thank you, Lord, that she's overcoming and will continue to overcome obstacles and continue to glorify you in all that she does. We pray for this next step, this continuing journey in her life, that you, Lord, would lead her, guide her, bring people into her life that she could minister to, love up on, and learn from each other. Father, we thank you for her. We thank you for the impact on this world that she is making. We thank you that your hand is upon her. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. My Sundays are not complete unless I get a hug from Anna. And she is faithful to give me a hug. Yeah, she's looking for me. She heard me, but she didn't see me. Yeah, this is what it's all about right here. Love you, girl. So proud of you. We're going to go ahead and uh, prepare for our tithes and offerings. So it, we get, we're giving online. We also, you can give at the four boxes uh, on the way out this morning. So let's go ahead and pray for our, our tithes and our offerings this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. It enables us to, in just one more way, be like you because you give so lavishly, so generously. And I thank you, God, for doing a work of generosity in this, this beautiful congregation, uh, work that they are growing in and continuing to minister to people, even through their finances. So continue to bless the funds, the resources of this church for the glory of your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, I left my notebook over here, I think. So, um, have you ever been put in a situation where you just you realize pretty quickly you were just way in over your head? You're just like, uh-oh, this is not one that I know how to deal with. Where you felt like, God, I, I think you really, I think you made a mistake on this one. I don't think I can work through this one. I don't think I can handle this one. Uh, I don't know what you're thinking, and so forth and so on. I want to share something with you this morning out of the book of 1 Kings about a fellow named Obadiah. And if he's kind of, you know, he's an obscure guy, and the, there's about 12 verses in the entire Bible that deal with Obadiah. Um, so you're probably not very familiar with him, and that's okay. I think you're going to become a friend of Obadiah by the end of the morning. And I think you're going to recognize that he's someone that you can really learn something from. So we talked about how the people of God, the nation of Israel had turned from God. They had begun to worship the idols of the Sidonians, which was a nation north of them. And their queen that uh, was a Sidonian woman by the name of Jezebel. Jezebel had brought in her gods to worship and convinced her husband Ahab to also worship these gods and to turn from the God of Israel, Jehovah. So God had proclaimed that there was going to be a drought through the prophet Elijah. And now, three and a half years later, think about it, a three and a half year drought. Three and a half years. That's a long time with no rain. Later on in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, Go and present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. So Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. Once, when Jezebel had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden 100 of them in two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, We must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way, Obadiah went another. 
As Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once and bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? He asked. Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master, Elijah is here. Oh, sir, Obadiah protested. What harm have I done to you that you're sending me to my death at the hands of Ahab? For I swear by the Lord your God that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. And each time he was told, Elijah isn't here. King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here? But as soon as I leave you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you off to who knows where. When Ahab comes and cannot find you, he will kill me. Yet I've been true servant of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid a hundred of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And now you say, go and tell your master Elijah is here? Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. But Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty in whose presence I stand that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Let's pray. Lord, help us to discern from these words what we can draw to be men and women of faith, men and women of courage, men and women of hope, men and women of trust who follow after you, Lord, regardless of whatever situation we find ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we talked before about how Ahab was trying to find... Elijah, because Elijah said, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. So we remember Elijah hid at the brook, the Cherith brook, until it dried up. And then after that, he went up to Sidon in the north, and he lived um, at the home of a widow there who provided for him. So he's hiding, basically, for his life at this point. And we're finding out why, because Ahab would have killed him if he could have found him. So... This fellow Obadiah is serving in Ahab's palace. I want you to think about this a minute. Can you imagine being a righteous, God-loving person serving in the palace of Jezebel and Ahab? Think about it for a minute. Jezebel had killed off all the Lord's prophets, and she was instituting Baal worship. And so here's this righteous man And he knows that this woman is killing off everybody who serves the Lord. But he has the courage to go and hide some of them in a cave and provide for them. God has a way of placing people where he wants them to be when they need to be there for his timing. But it's not always comfortable for the person who's been placed there. You ever been placed in a position and you go, I am not happy here, God, thank you very much. And the Lord says, you may not be happy, but you're exactly where I want you to be. And we squirm and try to do everything we can to get out of it. You know, can't you imagine? (laughs) I would imagine that Obadiah is like, he's getting on LinkedIn, he's doing everything he can, he's got a headhunter, find me a new place to work. I, I, I don't think I can stay here. This is a hostile work environment, I would say would be the case. Let's look at another couple of these in the scripture. The first one is Joseph. You know, Joseph was sold by his brothers in slavery. He was taken into Egypt. He was bought by a man named Potiphar. He was accused of sexual assault by Potiphar's wife, falsely accused, ended up in prison. It was there that he was discovered that he had this prophetic gift. He came before Pharaoh. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Pharaoh eventually set him up to be the number two man in charge of all of Egypt. And when he was put in place, it was to preserve 
multitudes of people and preserve his own family. God has a way of putting people where they need to be, when they need to be there, for his highest purposes. Then what about Daniel? Daniel was this Jewish man carried off to Babylon. He was uh, very bright, gifted. He was able to interpret the king's dream. The king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler of the whole province of Babylon as well as chief over all of his wise men. If you think about it, it's almost like these, these people are sleeper agents. I don't know if any of y'all read any espionage books, but it's kind of like these guys are sleeper agents that God has hidden away and cloistered in these different points and times, and he says, okay, I'm activating you, and I'm activating you. God has us in these places that he activates us at the right time for the right purposes for the glory of God. So let's look at a few more things about Obadiah. Obadiah acted upon his faith. His faith compelled him to rescue these hundred people who would have been killed by Jezebel. Now, not only did he rescue them, but he provided for them. How did he do that? He provided for them out of his own pocket, right? He put them in these two caves, and he fed them, and he gave them water, and he took care of them, and he hid them. At what cost? Well, at cost of his own money, and at what risk? What do you think Jezebel would have done if she'd have found out that he was hiding away a hundred of the people she was trying to kill? I think she said, oh, come here, give me a rest. Don't do that again. Now, go kill all them, and you're good. No, she would have had him killed. It was at great risk. It was at great, great cost. So what is it about faith? James, the Apostle James says, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I'll show you my faith by my good deeds. Genuine faith prompts us to action. There is a compelling a motivation to act upon what we claim to believe grace is free grace is absolutely free but faith costs us something you may go oh i don't know about that let me ask you this does your faith compel you to do anything unto god if it doesn't then James says you don't have genuine faith. So there is a cost involved. And it moves us to sacrificial love at personal expense. This is why it's so countercultural right now. Faith is countercultural now as much as ever. Why? Because we are in a society that's all about, well, it's all about what works for me. And I don't feel like that today or you know, I don't feel this, or I don't feel that, or I'm just not digging this vibe, so I'm going to do what I want to do. Faith compels us to action. Without it, James tells us our faith is dead. The currency of faith, there is a currency of faith. Currency of faith can be your time. If you're going to act upon your faith, it requires time, does it not? That's one of our greatest commodities is time. It also can be that it involves your money, that you actually do something like Obadiah did, that you support someone who is financially in need. It can cost us comfort and ease. If you've ever been on a short-term mission trip to a third-world country, you know that there is a cost to all the comfort that we're so accustomed to, to go and serve God by faith, in another area. That's why Peter tells us that our faith is more precious than gold. It's like a currency. It's something that does not fade away. It's something that is sustained, and it's something that grows. Faith also involves risk. If we are people of faith, it will compel us, propel us to take risks. 
I'm not talking about just foolish stuff just for the sake of doing it, but it motivates us to act upon things that we would not previously act upon. It may be that sometime you're in the grocery store or just going about your business and suddenly there's a prompting from the Holy Spirit that you should go offer to pray for this person. And you're like, uh, I think that's the devil. <laughs> no, you probably wouldn't think that. But, but if the Lord prompts you to do that, there's, there's a moment of decision there. Am I going to take the risk? Because if I take the risk, what's going to happen if they reject me? Or if they, you know, nothing happens? Have you ever offered to pray for somebody and they say, no, I'm good, leave me the heck alone? I have. You know? But I said, okay, great. And, and, but I wasn't rude. I wasn't, you know, they just, they knew, okay, I'm not into that. But I was kind. I was respectful. No harm, no foul. But if you go up to someone and you say, hey, can I pray for you? And they go, uh, yeah, sure. And you pray for them. You can trust that God is going to do something in that interaction. Even if you can't see it, you can trust that God is going to leave them knowing that someone cares for them, that God is concerned with their life. That requires a risk. It requires a risk to come when, when we're housing the homeless folks here and come and sit down with them and have a meal with them and engage with them like human beings. And to communicate with them like people who have value and worth. It takes risk. All of these things that, that when, when faith makes a difference, there's always risk involved. And Obadiah took a great risk. What about Peter in the boat? Lord, ah, it's a ghost. No, it's me. Oh, okay. Can I come out there? Sure, come on, Pete. He steps out on the water starts seeing the waves and everything. He gets scared. Ah, he starts to drown. Jesus pulls him up. You know the story. And we go, wow, Peter, man. He was looking, on the, he was looking at the wind and the waves and all that. <laughs> Peter got out of the stinking boat. The other ones didn't. You know? It's like, go, Pete. I mean, he took a risk. What about Peter and John before the Sanhedrin? Okay, you need to stop speaking in that name. You need to, uh, you know, we're going to throw you in jail. And they're like, hey, do whatever you want. We can't stop but tell what we've seen and we've heard. And by the way, you just killed the king of glory. See ya. You, that took risk. There was risk involved. There was risk involved for Obadiah to support these prophets. In Philippians, Paul, of course, is in prison and he's writing um, to the church at Philippi, and he's giving them information about their, their emissary, Epaphroditus, that they sent to Paul. He said, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He's a true brother, a co-worker, a fellow soldier. He was your messenger to help me in my need. I'm sending him because he was longing to see you, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. He almost died on the field. Uh, welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like that, him like that deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ. Faith compels us to take risks with our lives for the work of Jesus. Faith without works is dead. Faith will move you to greater risks than you would normally take on your own. What risks are you taking out of a motivation of faith working through love? I would, I would just tell you that if, you know, if you have a baby that's never hungry and doesn't want to eat, you know there's something wrong with the child and you need to take the child to a doctor. If there's nothing in you that ever has a desire to step out in faith 
and take a risk for God, you need to go to the doctor, Jesus, and ask him what's sick about your faith. Because something's not settled. Something's not right. Okay, the next thing we see about Obadiah is that he honored God, and he honored God's message. Matthew 10, Jesus tells you, if you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you'll be given the same reward as a prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you'll be given a reward like theirs. I couldn't say reward in the first service either. I said, whoa. I said, Epaphroditus without a problem. Several times, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus. Reward. I can't say reward. <sighs> At least I'm consistent. All right. You will be given an R-E-W-A-R-D like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Think about this. Think about Elijah. I mean, this is the dude who calls fire down from heaven. This guy is the rock star of prophets, okay? He is, he is the bomb. He is everything. And here Jesus is saying, oh, Obadiah got the same reward that Elijah got. What? Are you getting this? Come on, smile and be happy. This is good news. Y'all are looking like you've been weaned on dill pickles. <laughs> if you don't smile, I'll just preach longer. Y'all know how this works. Seriously, think about it. God says, if you receive what I'm sending you, if you embrace it, I'm going to reward you just like I would the one who brought it. That's a gift, man. That's just an incredible gift. Romans chapter 13, verse 7. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. Wait, is that in the Bible? Wow. Okay. It's in the Bible. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Our nation, I believe, has dramatically slipped in understanding the culture of honor. It's, it's a tragedy to me how there's so little honor in our nation. And unfortunately, it has infiltrated dramatically into the church. There's a lack of honor. I mean, you just, all you have to do is get on social media and you can take a pulse of what, how people dishonor one another and dishonor the body of Christ. Um, I, I tell you, it's alarming to me to see how many Christians on social media lob grenades at, quote, the church. Um... And, and, you know, it's easy to, it's, it's the ultimate armchair quarterbacking. It's, you know, well, the church should this, and the church should that, and the church should this, and the church should this. And I'm like, okay, go ahead and do it. You are the church. Really what it's saying is the leaders in the church are failing is what happens. And, and it's, it's over and over and over and over again. Let me give you an example. How many of you have ever had a problem with your computer? How many of you have ever had a problem with your computer that you could not solve? Well, when I get to that problem, I call one of two people. Or, or I'm so tech savvy, I can even email them. <laughs> so I email them, or I text them, or I call them and say, help. And they say, no problem. And they have some kind of magic where they can take their bodies and come into my computer from where they are and do all sorts of magic and fix it right there. And I'm like going, oh, it's glorious. It's just incredible. Now, I know very little about how to repair computers and software and all that. I know where the on button is and I know how to do uh, a few programs and I know how to play cards. So that's good. Anyway, it, seriously, if I knew a little bit more about it, you know, I might want to sit over their shoulders and go, 
I don't know, Randy, I don't think you're doing the right thing. I think you're, but I don't know nothing about it, so I'm just like, fix it, let me know when it's done. The problem is when we have a little bit of knowledge, we think we know a lot that we do not know. And this is what happens with a lot of, quote, Christians on social media. They know what people who are leading the church should do because they're not leading the church. It's very, very disturbing. Um, because what does it say to the rest of the world? It's just out there, you know? Um, and, and, and there's no honor in it. I told you a couple weeks ago about the guy in my last church who'd been fantasizing about killing me. Um, and this was a fellow who, I mean, he was educated. He loved Christian authors. And so he would compile quotes from his favorite Christian authors and he'd print them out on a sheet of paper and he'd hand them out to people. But he despised pastors. And, I, and not just me, I wasn't the only one. But I think the issue was with Christian authors, he could just take and pick and choose what he wanted. But with a pastor, week in, week out, speaking into his life, he didn't like some of what he was hearing. I got a letter last month, precious lady, you know, during the thank you month, uh, who said, thank you for stepping on my toes. And I was like, well, my toes get stepped on before I step on anyone else's. Um, you see, the issue is when there's a lack of honor in the body of Christ, then it causes the, the ministry of the gospel to be depleted. It really does. And I'm not talking about kowtowing to people who are in authority and, oh, pastor, leader, this. That's, I'm not talking about that nonsense. I'm talking about honoring the word of God and honoring the message and honoring the messenger. It's biblical. Now, let's contrast that with Ahab's response. Obadiah sees him. He, he, he bows and says, oh, my Lord, Elijah. And Ahab says, what are you doing here, you troublemaker of Israel? And this is kind of what we get on, on social media from a lot of church, about a lot of churches. What are, you, what are you doing, you troublemaker? Why are you not doing what you're supposed to be doing? It's, it's a travesty. It really is. All right, <clears throat> Obadiah also kept his eye on the long game. He was longing for justice. Do you ever just, well, there's some mornings you get up and you either look at the news or you think about everything that's going on in our nation, around the world, and you just think, oh, Jesus, please come. Please come. Please come and be king. Please come and establish your kingdom and bring righteousness. Bring justice. Revelation 11, 18. The nations were filled with wrath, but the time, now the time of your wrath has come. It's time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people. All who fear your name, from the least to the greatest, it's time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Don't you long for the day that God will destroy all who are fomenting wars and destruction and genocide and abortion and death and human trafficking around the world? Do you long for that? I do too. There's something in us that longs and it says, it's like the people of God through generations have said, oh God, how long? How long? And I think this is one of those, oh God, how long seasons that we're longing for something. That these unjust rulers, these power brokers around the globe that pad their bank accounts with corruption, that we long for God to come and make things right. And if we lose sight of the long game, the reality that Jesus will be anointed king over all, we'll become discouraged and we'll lose faith. Obadiah, every day he got up in the palace of Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, imagine. He could continue in his role serving a wicked king, knowing that God would provide for him, honor him, and ultimately 
prevail over all evil. That's what God will do. And we need to long for God to prevail against evil. Paul told the Colossian church, he said, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember, the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and the master you're serving is Christ. If you are working under someone who is more like an Ahab, you don't work under that person, you work under Christ. You've got to focus on where your work is. You're working unto Christ. And then Obadiah brought the message to the king. Now, as I was reading through this and studying it, I wondered why didn't Elijah just show up before Ahab? Why did he go through Obadiah? And the scripture doesn't tell us clearly why he did, but I think if you look at scripture, that there is a pattern throughout scripture that God desires to work through his people rather than instead of his people. So Obadiah was the conduit to communicate God's message that the prophet was coming instead of the prophet just showing up. This is that sleeper agent thing I was talking about. He's just minding his own business, doing his thing for all these years, crying out to God, being faithful, taking care of these prophets who were, would have been killed, and all of a sudden God says, time to activate you, buddy. And he goes, <gasps> he's going to kill me. And Elijah says, nope, I got it. Just do what I'm telling you. It reminds me of the story of Esther. You know, Esther was this Jewish uh, woman who was taken in to be the queen of all the land, pagan king. All she was doing was doing her queenly stuff, week in, week out, being queenly, being pampered, being taken care of, all of this stuff. All is good. All of a sudden, they find out that there's this plan to kill off all the Jews. So her uncle comes to her and says, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. In other words, God's going to do what God's going to do. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this? Who knows if you are not in the place you are right now for just such a time as this? You just think you're doing your job, and you are. But who knows if God hasn't placed you there for such a time when he will activate whatever it is that he has in mind, he has planned for you, so you can accomplish his purposes wherever you are. You know, there may not be any Elijahs in this room calling down prophets or calling down fire from heaven, but I do see a room full of Obadiahs. Faithful people serving where they are, waiting upon God, taking risks of faith, being faithful, trusting God and the long game. I want to be an Obadiah. And we can be Obadiahs in an Ahab world. Do you guys concur that we're in an Ahab world? We can be faithful and we can be Obadiahs even in a in a Ahab world. So how do you identify with him? I'd like to ask you to meditate on that this afternoon. While you're meditating on your fried chicken or whatever it is you're eating for lunch, meditate on how you identify with Obadiah. Now, are you serving under a boss that's more like Ahab than David? If you are, then you can commiserate with my staff. Take heart from the courage and focus on Obadiah. Take heart. Take courage. How is your faith compelling you to act for the glory of God and the benefit of others? If there's nothing going on, you need to wake up and say, Jesus, help me. I'm, I'm kind of flat. What am I doing for the kingdom? And how can keeping your focus on the long game sustain you while living in an Ahab world. Lord God, I'm thankful for your word.
I'm thankful for this man, however many thousands of years ago he was alive, who we can look to as a model that no matter what we're living under, we don't, we don't have to work in Ahab's palace. We don't have to fear for our lives because we want to be faithful to Jehovah. But we can learn from him. And we can learn of your faithfulness to him, Lord. You will be faithful. Now count us faithful, Lord. Help us to move into all you have for us with joy, knowing that we can be a part of the solution. Obadiah ended up bringing in Elijah, who ended up, for a short season, bringing a revival of the people back to Jehovah. Lord, bless this precious flock with truth, with courage, with endurance, with endurance, with hope, and with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.